first smoked cannabis when I was seven years old. I wouldn't recommend this to anybody. It wasn't as delinquent as it sounds. My brother Danny was 14 years old at the time, and he was using medical cannabis to help alleviate the symptoms from his aggressive chemotherapy regimen during his losing battle with childhood leukemia. My parents were out, and my brother Danny, he was a teenager after all, as a practical joke, passed me one of the joints he was smoking, and I took a puff. I spent the next 10 minutes gagging and coughing, and my brother Danny, who in truth was an incredibly kind and solicitous older brother, went in looking guilty and got me a cup of water. I've been involved with the cannabis issue my entire life, trying to see through the smoke and figure out what's true and what's not true. As I was growing up, I was exposed to four different sources of information about cannabis. The first was, as I alluded to, what I saw with my own eyes with my brother Danny. When my brother Danny didn't use medical cannabis, he was lying in his bed with a cold washcloth over his head, or he was barfing all over the house. When he did use medical cannabis, he was energetic and engaged, able to eat, and able to play with his little brothers. Needless to say, his little brothers preferred Danny when he was using medical cannabis. The second source of information as I was growing up had to do with my father's scholarship. My dad, Lester Grinspoon, was a psychiatrist, and in the late 1960s, he set out to write a book about cannabis. And he was intending to write a book about how, how crazy all the young people were for using this drug. But when he did a really deep dive into the literature, he found out that many, certainly not all, but many of the harms of cannabis had been exaggerated by the US government, and that the main harm lay in criminalizing all of the users of cannabis. His book, which came out in 1971, Marijuana Reconsidered, was reviewed on the front page of the New York Times Book Review in as glowing terms as a book can possibly get. It also landed him on Richard Nixon's enemies list. I learned a lot about cannabis just from watching my dad on TV and from discussing the issue with him and from seeing him testify and speak and write other articles and books over the next 50 years. The third source of information as I was growing up about cannabis, and probably the most impactful, was from the incredible assortment of academics, intellectuals, and scholars that were always congregated in our living room. Yes, they were smoking cannabis, but they were also discussing philosophy, literature, and all the burning social justice issues of the day. I remember that nuclear weapons, the nuclear holocaust, was a huge issue of the time. These conversations were electrifying. No kids were smoking cannabis at the time because uh, the rule was you had to be 18 to use cannabis because that was the drinking age. Or if you're my brother Danny, you had to be dying of cancer. But I came to see cannabis not just as a social lubricant, but as an intellectual lubricant as well. Now, the fourth source of information as I was growing up was the D.A.R.E. program that many of us participated in, in grade school and in high school where the same policemen would come in year after year and tell us the cannabis made you dumb, irresponsible, and amotivational. And it wasn't just in school. Society bombarded us with these messages. I bet many of you remember the ads where they would take an innocent egg and fry it into oblivion and say, this is your brain on drugs. Now, it didn't take me that long to realize which of the two narratives I was sympathetic to the cannabis is evil narrative, or the cannabis is a helpful wellness tool narrative. Now, neither narrative is completely true. Uh, the truth is somewhere in between, and this is an incredibly complex and nuanced issue. But generally speaking, first of all, none of the kids believe the D.A.R.E. narrative because it was propaganda. And kids have very, very good BS detectors. Second of all, in my home, for example, a frequent guest would be Carl Sagan. He, in a cloud of marijuana smoke, would be explaining the nature of life in the universe or whether there are life on other planets or the nature of human consciousness. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, if this is amotivational, I'd hate to see what motivational looks like. Um, the whole edifice of the D.A.R.E. program collapsed around me at a pretty early age. And this brings up a really complicated issue of what do you do if what you believe is very different from what you're being taught in school and by society. This is very confusing as a teenager, by the way. 
And it also brings up a more complicated issue of what do you do when you th what you think is right is different from what the law provides for. My parents, my mild-mannered mom, bought cannabis for my brother Danny. This was at the height of Richard Nixon's war on drugs. It was illegal, but clearly it was the right thing to do. Any parent would do this for their kids if they had the knowledge and the ability. Now this issue of the dichotomy between what's legal and what's moral pertains to so many issues of our day. Think, for example, of gay marriage. Until recently, gay marriage was illegal in many parts of this country. Does that mean that gay marriage is wrong? Of course not, the law is wrong. Now, as it pertains to cannabis, uh, fewer people are getting arrested than used to get arrested because it's legal, fortunately, in some states. But in the year 2019, more than 500,000 people got arrested for cannabis-related charges. Now, blacks and whites use cannabis at about the same rate, but blacks get arrested four times as often as whites. This is completely unacceptable. When you get arrested and involved in the criminal justice system, it can affect the entire trajectory of your life. It can affect your education, your student loans, your employment, your housing. It can cause generational poverty in communities of color. And you have to weigh this with the uh, health effects of using a medicinal plant. Are there harms? Of course there are harms. There are harms with every single medicine that I prescribe as a primary care doctor but the harms pale in comparison to the harms of using a medicinal plant. Now, to bring this full circle back to my family, in the summer of 2020, my father passed away from the three cancers that he was contending with. We decided with his input to use medical cannabis instead of opiates uh, to treat his, the chronic pain and the insomnia and the other discomforts that come along with fighting off three cancers. In fact, he only needed two doses of morphine to pass from this world into the next. Because we used cannabis instead of opiates, he wasn't super sedated at the end, and he was able to fully participate in life right until the very end. The night before he passed away, we had a birthday party for him on Zoom because of the pandemic, and he was able to fully participate. He even made a couple jokes. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, he. You know, it was with all of his grandkids. Uh, this wouldn't have been the case if he were on opiates, I don't think. But anyways, because cannabis helped my brother Danny live with dignity and in comfort and helped my dad die with dignity and in comfort, it cemented in me three lessons that transcend the cannabis issue and that I'd like to share. The first lesson is we have to resist groupthink. My dad was under so much pressure to write a book about how bad cannabis was. He was under pressure from the US government, from the medical establishment, all the other psychiatrists, um, and by, from the medical school where he was working. But he thought for himself, he independently looked at the research, and he stayed true to his principles. And he ended up writing a book that advanced our knowledge on the issue, and that was on the right side of history. So the message is, we have to think for ourselves, and we have to stay true to our principles no matter what the cost is. And believe me, there were costs to my dad. But when you think about it, what are we beyond our principles? I think that's a very elemental part of who and what we are is our principles. And we have to stay true to them. Number two, our role as doctors doesn't end as we leave the exam room. If our patients don't have a roof over their heads, if they can't pay for food or pay for their medicines, or if they're getting arrested for using some drugs, or they're allowed to use other drugs like caffeine or, or alcohol, which is more dangerous than cannabis, or if we're prescribing oxycodone and they're allowed to use it, but they're, they're getting arrested for heroin, which is the same thing, just a minor chemical difference, then our jobs aren't done. The fight for social justice is an integral part of what doctors and other healthcare providers need to be doing. What we see during our clinical visits is just a slice of our, parents, of our patients' lives. And we could pretend that that's their whole lives, but in reality, it's just a slice. And we need to be using our incredible power and prestige to be making a healthy world for our patients so that we're actually taking care of the whole patient and that we're actually taking care of their entire health, not just the little slice that we see. The third lesson, the final lesson is, the world that we live in, the world that we all inhabit, is not fixed. It's not some preordained thing. 
like um, a book, a work of fiction that's already written or a TV show that's already recorded. We can change the world. It's fixable, it's changeable. I saw this over the last 50 years with my dad's work, with his advocacy, his writing, his testimony. We can change things, but it involves a couple of things. We have to roll up our sleeves. We have to get out of our individual silos. And this is where community, community is a critical part of this. And most important of all, we have to believe that we can change the world. And I know that this can happen. Now, I would humbly suggest that we start with the war on drugs. We need to dismantle the war on drugs completely. The war on drugs, I've followed this issue my entire life. The war on drugs has nothing to do with drugs. There have always been drugs. All societies have used intoxicants. The war on drugs is a war on people, and it's a war on four specific groups of people. Of people. It's a war on people that use drugs. It's a war on people that are addicted to drugs, and they need compassion. They need treatment. They certainly don't need criminal justice involvement. That's the last thing they need. The war on drugs is a war on chronic pain patients that need to use certain medications, such as opiates, that our government happens to frown upon. And finally, the war on drugs is a war on people of color. People of color have always been disproportionately affected by the war on drugs, and it's absolutely disgusting, and it needs to end. We need to take control of drugs out of the hands of law enforcement. They have all the wrong incentives. They want to fluff up their arrests, or they want to increase their numbers of arrests. They like easy arrests. Uh, law enforcement likes to seize assets. They can say, oh, you're involved in drug trafficking. I'm going to seize your property. And they, they find that as a way to enrich themselves. They like to uh, magnify their budgets. Um, but the fact is, we need to take the control of drugs out of the hands of law enforcement and put it into the hands of people that care about other people and put it in the hands of people that are equipped to help people that are addicted to drugs and that are equipped to help people that are suffering from chronic pain. So these people are doctors, lawyers, social workers, public health officials, and scientists. We need to end the war on drugs so that people like my mom, my dad, and my brother Danny never would have been criminalized in the first place. Thank you for listening.